Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulihi al-karim wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsani ila yawmiddin. Rabbi syrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Allahumma subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana innaka antal alimul hakim. Allahumma amin. Amma ba'd. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So uh, today inshallah we're going to uh, have a discussion about the first five ayat of Surah Al-Alaq, which uh, according to the majority of scholars is the first revelation, the first uh, time that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, received uh, uh, the word of Allah. Um, so let's start by, I, I believe most of you, if not all, have already memorized this surah, but uh, I'll start by reciting it. Uh, meanwhile, you can read the translation to familiarize yourself again. And then we'll go into the content. A'udhu billah min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Iqra' bismi rambika alladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Iqra' wa rabbuka al-akram. Alladhi allama bil-qalam. Allama al-insana ma lam ya'lam. Sadaq Allah al-Azim. Uh, my chief's teacher, Norman, Ustad Norman, is uh, sitting there, so he will mark my recitation later, inshallah. Um, but uh, most of us are familiar with these five ayat, and we get to know that uh, this is the first revelation through a very long narration, which is in Sahih al Bukhari, uh, narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha. And uh, it's actually very, very uh, detailed in describing how the Prophet وسلم, started his prophethood. How did he? Uh, come to contact with revelation. How did he uh, receive the the mission as a messenger? Uh, it actually, this narration starts before the first revelation. It talked about how he started having prophetic dreams, meaning dreams that are uh, described by Aisha clear as days. You see something that happened, and then the next thing, it, it, next day, it happened. So from here and some other narrations, we also get to know that prophetic dream. Uh, is a part of prophethood. And the Prophet Sallallahu actually says, if you, any of you, see a prophetic dream, a dream that comes true, that is 146 of prophethood. And he said, because the later generations will not have prophets anymore, uh, because he has sealed the chain of prophets, so later on, Allah makes up for the Ummah by uh, enabling some people to have prophetic dreams every now and then. So the scholars, they categorize dreams into three categories. There's the uh, Rahmani, the, the dream that is from Allah, that is by the mercy of Allah. So a lot of times it gives you glad tidings, it inspires you, it gives you more motivation to worship, etc. And there's also a, a, a nafsani, which is basically based on our nafs. You think about something a lot during the day, and you dream about it during the night. And then the third category is shaitani, uh, usually the nightmares, things that make you scary, things that make you uh, feel bad and have negative emotions, that is a lot of times from shaitan. <clears throat> so here, we actually see that uh, preceding the revelation, uh, there were dreams that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw uh, that could tell the reality. And then later on, he started having a love for uh, seclusion, for being alone. So this is also uh, one of the traits uh, that enabled him to get into contact with revelation later on. Uh, so one day he was in Hira, the famous story, uh, Jibreel السلام, came to him and said, without any self introduction, without any small talk, iqara directly, right? Read, it's a command. And as nervous and as shocked and uh, as scared as he was, he وسلم, said, Ma ana biqari, I'm, I'm not able to read. And actually, the ma and bi, this combination, so there are, as I mentioned, there are four ways of negating in Arabic language. There are four, you can say, laysa, you can say, lastu qari. You can say lastu biqari. You can say ma ana qari. You can say ma ana biqari. So ma ana biqari is the strongest ver ver version of negation, which should be translated as I've never been able to read. Like I've never been. This has never uh, been one of my abilities. So it's uh, the strongest uh, version of negation. Ma ana biqari. I've never been able to read. But then uh, Jibril alayhi salam held him very tightly until he couldn't breathe, and then he said again iqra. 
he still said, I cannot read. So this process uh, repeated three times. And then after uh, the, the third time, uh, Jibreel -Islam started reciting the first revelation, which mm -hmm. is uh, the, five, for, uh, the first five ayat of Surah Al-Alaq, which I just recited. And after this, he disappeared. Jibreel -Islam disappeared. And then Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he returned with a very, very scary uh, uh, mood. And then he said, you know, Zamminuni, uh, Zamminuni, cover me, cover me. Zamiluni, Zamiluni, cover me, cover me. And he was very scared. He said, Qad li nafsi. I, I fear for myself. I fear it's something bad that happened to me. Maybe I saw a devil or something. Uh, but his wife, Khadija, anha, counseled him and calmed him down and comforted him, with, which showed uh, what a successful marriage should be like. It's, it's something that we should learn from and look up to, actually. Uh, basically, uh, Khadija, anha, before even becoming a Muslim, already showed some characteristics of a righteous wife. Um, so she and and also showed that in the fitrah, this is before Islam, before any revelation, uh, before uh, this is the first revelation. So before any uh, concept of iman or you know uh, Allah is being talked about, but in the fitrah, the Prophet says, "Kullu mauludin yuladu al fitrah." All newborns are born upon the fitrah. So in our nature, in our human nature, we actually acknowledge some. Uh, some uh, attributes of Allah. We actually have certain understandings about the Creator and what we expect of Him. So Khadija radiallahu anha, without having uh, made any contact with the revelation, she said, Kalla, Allah will never disgrace you because you are a good person, basically. She listed some of the good traits of the Prophet For example, she said, uh, you know, you're the one who uh, uh, rush to aid people when they're in need and you're the person who uh, treat your guest with honor you honor your guest and you're the ones that treat the orphans nicely etc so basically you're a nice person Allah will never disgrace you so this idea was even uh, so this idea was held by her even before she knew Islam and then later on uh, so the Prophet Sallallahu comes down and Khadija radiallahu anha took her to uh, took him to uh, one of her cousin Waraka ibn Nawfal who was uh, one of the few uh, Arab people who was not, <coughs> not satisfied with the idol worship tradition of their people who went abroad and went far away to, to try to find the religion of God. And some of them found Judaism, some of them found Christianity. So Waraka ibn Nawfal, he found Christianity and he be became a Christian scholar. He was very learned. He actually learned the Hebrew language and he was able to write the Hebrew language. Uh, uh, and he was a very old man by the time. He was already blind. So when they went to him and told him the story, he said that indeed this is An-Namus, the one who holds the secrets. Uh, according to the biblical tradition, the Christian tradition, he knows that this is the angel that came to Musa and Isa So he said this is An-Namus. Uh, and he told the Prophet Sallallahu that your people are, gonna, uh, are going to chase you out of your city. They're going to expel you. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, me? They're going to chase me out? In a very shocked manner. Because... As, as we know uh, from Khadija radiallahu anha, he's perhaps the most loved person in the society. He would be the last person to be expelled from the city. Everybody loves him. Everybody trusts him. Everybody likes him. He said, me? They're going to turn me out? And then this person, Waraq ibn Nawfal, was very firm. Yeah, they're going to turn you out. They're going to chase you out. And he said, I wish I was younger. Because if I were younger, I would support you with all my strength. I would support you when that happens, when they actually uh, start treating you with enmity. Uh, and hostility. Uh, so basically this is the uh, first encounter of the Prophet Sallallahu with Jibreel Al-Islam and also with the speech of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So of course if Allah decided to review these five ayat uh, among more than 6,000 ayat of the Quran, of course it holds very special meaning uh, and it has a very special position in the Quran and uh, uh, it basically uh, sets a platform or a foundation for our further understanding of the Qur'an and our further interaction with the Qur'an. So um, without further ado, let's just look into this ayat and try to find some wisdoms which may not have been discovered by you before, inshallah. So Allah says, uh, First of all, the first word that was revealed from the Qur'an, from the speech of Allah to the Prophet ﷺ was an amr, was a command, was uh, a very direct command. Iqra, read. And this shows the power and authority and dignity of the speaker, right? Uh, when people speak, usually only people of position speak this way. Your father can say to you, come here. You cannot say to your father, come here. 
otherwise a janaza happens that day. Uh, especially in traditional cultures, like the Pakistani culture, like the Chinese culture. The Western culture is different nowadays. The Western culture, they can say, Jack, I don't agree with you. A child can say to the father. But in China and in Pakistan, I'm pretty sure that's not the case. You have to, even the language is different when you use towards someone higher than you and towards someone lower than you, right? When you ask, what's your name? Abkanam kya hai is a, is a respectful term that you use for people have, who have higher position and authority. And you use a different term for the people who are younger than you. So. Actually, the position we're at changed the way we speak. Uh, that applies to all nations. When we are at a different position, we speak differently, we choose our language differently, with the exception of Donald Trump. <coughs> um, but usually, like when you are a student, you talk to your teacher respectfully. May I ask a question? Can I go to the toilet? Can I do this? Can I do that? But when you are the teacher, even if you're from the same school, you graduated from the school, you become a teacher there, you speak differently. Oi, kya kar ho? Right? Different. So um, here Allah is using the, the way of speech. So when we speak, there are two elements of speech. One is the content. What are you saying? What, what is the meaning of your speech? The other is the way of speech. The same thing can be said very differently. Right? Uh, the, uh, as I said, you can say, uh, could you please come here? Can I, can I ask you for something? Can I, can I borrow a minute of yours? That's one way of saying. There's another way of saying is, come here. So uh, the same meaning, the same content, but different way of speech. So here, Allah is directly addressing the listener in a very, very uh, uh, demanding and, uh, how to say, authoritative manner. Iqra, read. Without, it's not, would you please read for me or something like that. It's very powerful. And this actually is a special feature of the Qur'an, which is Allah's speech has no hesitation, no uncertainty. There is no uh, political correctness in it. Like Allah doesn't consider how the listener uh, feels emotionally, he will talk about the things that he needs to talk about in a way that he likes to talk about. So that's why when we read a description of Jahannam, it's horrible. It terrifies us. Allah doesn't have to sugarcoat it and tell you, well, it's really bad, but I will not, you know, it's PG-18, I will not describe the details, it may be too much for you, you will have nightmares. No, he will just describe as horrible as it is, as a mercy actually to remind us of the reality of things. So. Uh, this actually compares with uh, many other spiritual schools or philosophies or even uh, many other organized religions. I actually read uh, one of the Baha'i book. There's a Baha'i faith. I, w I read one of the Baha'i book before I carefully read the Quran. So that book, many concepts are the same from the Quran because even Baha'u'llah is from Persia and he had a lot of influence from uh, Islam. But, uh, you know, when I read it, I was like, I, I finished reading the entire chapter and then I was like, what is this talking about? A very very decorative language like the divine light of God, right? Uh, phrases like this, which make you more confused. It confuses more than it clarifies. But to Allah, what, what we find in the Quran is that the message is very clear and straightforward. It's very concrete and practicable. Most for most verses in the Quran, anybody who knows the Arabic language can understand. You don't have a, you don't have to have a PhD to understand. Most of the verses have a very uh, you know, uh, clear meaning, especially the commands and prohibitions. Do something, don't do something, very clear. Enter Islam complete, completely, wholeheartedly. Or, you know, don't follow the footsteps of shaitan. Very clear, very straightforward. And this is how God talks. This is how God is supposed to talk. Um, and we would also find that um, it's different when Allah commands the prophets and messengers to talk. It's different now. They don't have the right to speak in the way that Allah speaks. That's why when Allah command Musa السلام, for example to talk to Fir'aun, اذهب إلى فرعون إنه طغى فقل هل لك إلى أن تزكى He said go to Fir'aun, indeed he has uh, rebelled, he has transgressed. Tell him, would you consider, do you want to purify yourself? Would you consider purifying yourself? Do you think it's a good idea that you should purify yourself? هل لك إلى أن تزكى It's a very polite uh, way of saying actually. And even the, our Prophet وسلم, in the Quran, many times he is commanded to say in a very polite manner, Say, should I inform you of something better than this? This is in the Quran. And also in a lot of hadith, you would find the Prophet وسلم, before he teaches his uh, companions, his Sahaba, he would say, should I, conf should I inform you of something nice? Should I tell you what is the best expression? He would use this kind of phrase. So it's different from Iqra, read. That kind of uh, power and authority belongs to Allah. And this is one thing that really impressed me personally when I first read the Qur'an. Not only the content of the Qur'an, uh, not only 
you know, the unseen, the things that we don't know about, the hereafter, etc. That is powerful enough itself. But also the way Allah talks about these things, it makes you immediately feel that this is not from a human being. No human being talks like, Inna Allah fadli ala nasi, akthar nasi la Indeed, Allah possesses great favor upon human beings, but the majority of them are not grateful. This is not, this doesn't sound like it's from a human being. And when Allah says that, that the disbelieving people are going to hellfire, they're going to pay for their consequences, it doesn't have to be very, you know, soft and hides away and shy away and use soft language. No. Say to the disbelievers, you are going to be defeated and you are going to be gathered into Jahannam. Very clear, very powerful. So although this may challenge the nafs when a disbeliever or when somebody who doesn't know Islam hears this, it challenges them, it, it agitates them. But this is how God is supposed to speak. He doesn't shy away. Uh, he, he, he's not uh, limited by any kind of uh, you know, uh, c concern for reaction or concern for feedback. Another thing is that we, clear, we clearly know that the Prophet ﷺ is illiterate and this is confirmed by Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He calls him an, an Nabi al-Ummi, uh, an unlettered prophet, an illiterate prophet, because the, the word Ummi actually, uh, unlettered, comes from Umm, mother, which means in terms of formal education, in terms of the ability to speak and to write, a per, this person, an Ummi, is uh, basically similar to somebody who's just born, just come from the mother. So he has no idea of Alif Batata, he doesn't know how to read. But still Allah said, Iqara, read. So uh, one of the ways to understand this is that this is already an indication that this revelation is not for him individually, but is facing the entire world. The, the, the audience is extended. So despite your being an, uh, an illiterate person, uh, this revelation will still be given to you and you will still be commanded to proclaim it. So it's for an extended audience uh, beyond himself. And... Uh, Let's think about the fact that the first command from Allah is Iqara, is read. And in the Quran there are so many other commands in the same form, very direct, very straightforward. For example, U'abudu. Ya ayyuhanna su'abudu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum. O human beings, worship your master who created you. For example, ittaqu, fear, be conscious of Allah. Very, ya ayyuhalladhin amanu ittaqu Allah. Right? Uh, or, Ya ayyuhal nasu kulu mimma fil ard. Oh, human beings, eat from whatever is in the earth. There are so many other commands and instructions uh, in the Quran, but this one is picked to be the first command uh, to be told to human beings, which shows that to read, to recite, to, to get in touch with revelation is the foundation of all other actions. If you want to worship properly, you need to read. You need to know how uh, Allah expects us to worship. If you want to eat properly, you need to read. You need to know what is uh, halal and what is tayyib and what is not. If you want to truly be conscious of Allah and fear of Allah, you need to read. Uh, through His revelation, you will understand His attributes and His, his uh, characteristics. So, so the qira'ah, our reading and recitation of the Qur'an becomes the foundation of all other actions. In other words, knowledge should precede uh, words and actions. Because reading, to read, one of the primary purposes of reading is to learn something that you don't know before. You read a book so that you can learn things you don't know before. And this is actually one of the, uh, the, the name of one of the chapters in Sahih al-Bukhari, which is Al-Ilmu Qabla al-Qawli uh, qawl, wal-Amal, that uh, knowledge should precede words and actions. Uh, so this, this concept uh, is also being uh, represented here by, be, uh, by saying Iqara uh, uh, before any other commands and any other uh, instructions. And then Allah says, Bismi Rabbika, in the name of your Lord. So let's uh, look at the word Rabb a little bit. So Rabb has the meaning of possessor, master, somebody who owns. So it has the meaning of Malik. Uh, so it also has the meaning of uh, Sultan, someone who has control and authority over. Someone who has the say, has the right to decide. It also has the meaning of Murabbi. So Rabbi Yurabbi also means to bring up, to nurture, to, to uh, nourish somebody, to bring a, a child up. And that's why tarbiya is uh, used for education, to bring somebody up with good moral conduct and moral character. character. So Rabbuka, uh, Rabbika here is actually saying, in the name of the one who uh, made you, who owns you, who has control over you, who has authority over you, and who brought you up, who nurtured you, who educated you, who brought you up. So this relates to Iqara. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ma ana biqari, I don't know how to read. By saying, Rabbika Allah is saying, yes, of course, I know you, don't, you can't read. I brought you up. I know exactly why you can't read and how you can't read. But still, uh, you read. 
in the name of your master. And another meaning of uh, uh, another thing that uh, is being conveyed by Rabbika is so Rabb also means somebody who t takes care, a caretaker, right? Uh, the the head of the house is called Rabbul Dar or Rabbul Bayt. Sometimes Rabbul Aila, the head of a family, means the one who takes care of the family, the one who owns the uh, uh, so, sorry, the one who earns the uh, livelihood of the family. So Allah is also saying in the name of the one who took care of you, the one who fed you. So we know that after this message started being proclaimed, multiple uh, sources of attacks, all kinds of uh, attacks are being directed to the Prophet وسلم, so that he would stop his mission, so that he would stop his message. <coughs> And Allah knows this is going to happen. Actually, even, even Waraqa ibn Nawfal knew this would happen. So Allah is actually doing a prep talk here to secure him. Although he doesn't know what's going to happen, but after a while when he, re when he recites this surah by himself, he would know, he would find counsel in this. Because you will face enemies after enemies after enemies. You will face attack after attack after attack. But just as Allah has taken care of you all along, since you were, since you were born until now, as an orphan you were taken care of, as someone who didn't know how to read and write, you were taken care of. As someone, you know, who, who didn't have a lot of uh, support, you were taken care of. Allah has been taking care of you all this time. So He will continue to take care of you after you start to proclaim your message. So this is like a prep talk to, uh, to make the Messenger وسلم, feel more uh, courageous and secure, to feel more uh, security in a way. And... Uh, <clears throat> So, in the name of somebody, what does this mean? In the name of your, your Rabb. Actually, this is not a, an exclusively religious expression. If you are uh, interested in medieval European history, when you read about the you know, chivalry and lord and the castles, these things, you would find this expression very common among the knights. When they try to seize a castle, they will say, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm seizing this castle in the name of lord so-and-so. Right? They're representing somebody. Uh, they're... they're uh, calling onto an authority or sovereignty that's higher and, and bigger than them to uh, start and com uh, com commence a military action or economic action or diplomatic and political action. They say in the name of somebody. Even in Chinese culture, I'll show you a picture. I don't know if any of you have seen any uh, Chinese TV shows. But uh, when, they, when they depict the ancient emperors, there is a thing called imperial edict, which means the emperor wants something to be done or wants to tell somebody something but he's busy. He cannot go himself. So he will say something, it will be recorded by his like secretary, and then the secretary will put it on a very, very nice piece of scroll, very nice scroll, and give it to a government official, who will then go to that person and say, which means, in the name of the sky, the emperor has said the following, and he will read. Basically, and the sky in the Chinese culture, uh, according to most, they actually understand it as the only unified, only source of power and force, the highest command, which is similar to uh, the concept of uh, Ila, of a god, of a, a, a one creator. So basically, you can say this is similar to saying Bismillah, in the name of Allah, the, uh, the emperor has said, the king has said. So they're also calling on the name of somebody else. What is the purpose of calling the name of somebody else? Let's go back and try to understand Bismillah Rabbika, what does that do? Firstly, uh, the, scholars, the scholars, they have commented, this means with the assistance of your Rabb, with the assistance and help from your master. Because it, it is not going to be easy for you to read. Because first of all, you, you, you don't even have the capacity to, to read. But Allah said, We will make you read. We will imprint the message, a message in your heart and you will not forget. So without the assistance of Allah, this cannot be done. Only by the assistance and, and aid of Allah can this uh, divine you know, uh, recitation uh, be finished. So that's the first meaning, with the assistance of your Lord. And when we say that a lot of times, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, we are also seeking assistance from Allah, right? Uh, most of us never say Bismillah until we go to exam hall. We have an exam paper in front of us, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, with Tajweed and everything, and then you start writing your exam paper because you need assistance now. So Bismillah actually takes assistance in. The second meaning is, uh, Allah is actually commanding the Prophet وسلم, to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, to, to mention the name of Allah. And that's why all of the surah in the Quran, except one, begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is to inform people that the following words are not my words. 
the following mm. content is not from me. They don't represent my desires, they don't represent my opinions and my ideas. The following mm. message is from Allah, the most merciful, the continuous and repetitively merciful. So that is a command from Allah to uh, basically let people know uh, from whom these words are from. The third meaning and the third uh, benefit of Bismi Rabbika in the name of your Lord is actually to remember Allah. When you, when you mention the name of Allah, you are immediately remembering Allah. And, and that's a form of worship. So even some scholars, they give a very beautiful uh, interpretation. They say, Iqra bismi rabbika means read so that you can remember your master. Read for the purpose of remembering and, and, uh, and uh, uh, worshipping your master. So that applies to all of us. Iqra, the purpose of your recitation, read the Quran, is ultimately to remember Allah so that you can worship Him more properly, so that you can feel a stronger connection and attachment to our Rabb, to the one who has been taking care of us. So that's why if you only recite for the, for the sake of reciting, that is far from the teaching of this ayah, the first ayah that's, recite, uh, that's re reviewed. Some people, they recite for the purpose of Barakah, which is good. Uh, indeed, every, every uh, harf, Every letter from the Qur'an brings barakah to us. But here Allah is saying, Iqra, read, so that you can remember your Lord, so that you can have a better understanding of the attributes of your master. And then we move on to Alladhi Khalaq, the one who created. So here, uh, first of all, Allah didn't say, uh, Bismi uh, Rabbil Alameen, in the name of the Lord of the words. It's not a very grand dis uh, description here. It's a very personal, actually, very subtle description. Your master, singular, Rabbika, your master, and Iqra is also a singular command, you alone, you read. So here, actually, uh, if we extend a little bit, the meaning is, so the Messenger of is now being assigned the task to tell people the truth and to invite people to the truth, to call people towards Allah. But before all of the, those can be done, Allah is saying, you personally, alone, you need to have a personal relationship, individual relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a teaching to all the du'at. Anybody who wants to do da'wah, anybody who wants to call people towards Allah has to remember that you have to maintain your personal and individual relationship with Allah first. That is very important. If a person is not worshipping Allah properly, he can speak very nicely. He can use the best form of language. He can speak multiple languages, but that language just doesn't reach the heart of people. There are, there are many speakers I've seen who speak uh, English worse than me. Their use of English is worse than me. But when they speak, tears flow from the, from the eyes of people. People's hearts tremble. That is, that is because uh, Allah knows the best, but that appears to be because they have a better individual relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than me. So anyone who wants to do, to do da'wah has to bear in mind that you have to have a relationship with your master first, your singular. Allah khalaq, the one who created. Here Allah is describing himself. It's, it's a self-introduction to the Prophet sallallahu But Allah has many attributes we know of, right? He can say the one who created. He can say the one who taught. He can say the one who had mercy upon the words. And there are so many attributes of Allah. Why did he chose uh, khalq? The, the, the fact that he's khaliq kulli shay, the, the, the creator of everything, in this first revelation. Think about it. Many, many attributes of Allah are actually shared by people, although not to the same magnitude. For example, Allah uh, shows mercy. We can also show mercy. But of course, our... Uh, that's why Allah is called ar rahman rahimi the most merciful among all of those who show mercy. So people can also show mercy. Animals can also show mercy. But none of the, none of the uh, creation who show mercy can reach the magnitude of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the hadith says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created 100 portions of mercy and only one of them is descended in the, uh, among the creation for them to have mercy uh, between each other. So, for example, forgiveness. Allah forgives, we also forgive, we can also forgive people, although not, never to the same magnitude. And uh, <clears throat> for example, Allah teaches, Allah is the one who has knowledge. People also have knowledge, right? Allah has wisdom, people also have no, uh, wisdom. Allah can plan, people also plan. They plan and Allah plans and Allah is the best planner. So many of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are actually shared by people. Or sometimes people are being intermediary of the manifestation of his attributes. For example, Allah is the, uh, is the provider, is al-razaq. But actually, when we were children, directly we were provided for, by our parents. So they are an in intermediary of Allah's provision. So we sometimes feel that provision also comes from human beings, but uh, ultimately, eventually, provision comes from Allah. What I'm saying is that 
many of the attributes are not exclusive to Allah. Although walam yakullahu kufwa ahad, none can compare to Him in any attribute, in terms of magnitude and in terms of nature. But still, human beings possess the ability to do many things that Allah also does, such as to show mercy, to forgive, to provide, etc. But khalq, creation, is an attribute exclusive to Allah without any intermediary, without any duplicate. Nobody can work, create anything. Nobody can create anything at any time uh, except Allah. Only Allah can create. So, um, for example, uh, when I was in high school, if you took high school physics, one of the most fundamental laws or rules, even in mathematics as well, is the law of uh, conservation of energy, which states, and I quote Wikipedia, <laughs> um, sorry, yeah, Brother Ramiz, can you read the highlighted version, uh, the highlighted sentence here above? This law means that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Okay, Jazakallah khair. And someone who has good eyesight back there, Brother Daniel, you have good eyesight, can you read the highlighted uh, sentence here below? The law implies that mass can neither be created nor destroyed. So, basically, uh, science tells us that energy cannot be uh, created, Mass cannot be created, and the entire existence as we know it is mass and energy. That's it. The entire existence as we know it is composed of mass and energy. But we now know, and we actually have known for a long time, that energy cannot be created and mass cannot be created. So uh, energy can only be transformed from one form to another form, but the amount doesn't change. So when I was learning high school physics, I was like, okay, so where did this amount come from? Since we cannot create a bit, we cannot even create one joule of energy, where does this energy come from? And who decided this amount? Why is it not a little bit more? Why is it not a little bit less? Why is this the amount, the specific amount of energy that we have? Why is this the specific amount of mass that we have? Right? So this is actually, uh, so when I talk to people who study science or chemistry or biology, things like that, I, I tend to use this as uh, one of the ways to uh, illustrate the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Allah is the only one that can create. The definition of creation is to bring something into existence which was not there before, which didn't exist before. We can invent things, we can make things, we can produce things through chemical, uh, uh, we can, through chemical reaction, we can produce new substances, but they're not from nothing, they're from something else. It's only a transformation, it's not creation. So human beings never created anything. We only transformed and transformed and transformed. That's it. Uh, but Allah is the one who provided all the resources. So if you look at the city, you would see none of this is, is created by Allah. Well, actually, as a matter of fact, all of this is created by Allah. The car is made of uh, iron and other metals, and we didn't create those metals. And the oil uh, that the car burns, we didn't create the oil, right? All of the uh, natural resources and substances, we didn't put them there. The human beings just made, made use of them and Allah is the one who created them. So here Allah is actually describing one of the most fundamental and exclusive attribute of His, which is creation. He's saying, read in the name of your master who created. And note that the next ayah, خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ alaq. There is like a, like a pause here. اِقْرَأْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ alaq. Why is the word خَلَقَ repeated? It would, be a, it would be a complete sentence if you say اِقْرَ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقَ It's a complete sentence. Read in the name of your master who created human being from a cloud of blood. And that's actually more, more concise. And Arabs, they love conciseness. They like to make things short. They like to use the minimum amount of language to express the maximum amount of information. Right? So here it seems it's redundant. A word is repeated, but the meaning, you know, the meaning is, uh, is, flow, is, is flowing. But actually, if we take a closer look, uh, the first sentence, if you stop it there, it doesn't have a maf'ul bihi, which means that the verb created doesn't have an object. So you can put anything in and the word uh, and the sentence uh, holds. So you, the things you know of, Allah created them. The things you don't know of, Allah created them. The things you can see, Allah created them. The, the things you cannot see, Allah created them. The things you are worshipping, Allah created them. So what's the point of worshipping them then? This is actually very powerful. So iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Think about it, when this verse is being recited to the Quraysh, to the, to the idol-worshipping people, I'm reciting in the name of my master who created. They say, created what? what? Created. <laughs> anything you can name. Name anything he created. Anything besides Allah is created by him. So actually this also indicates la ilaha illallah. So the fundamental 
uh, creed of Islam is also being uh, expressed in Iqara Bismi Rabbika Ladi Khalaq. It's also to humble human beings because if he said, he's the one, your master, who created human beings from a cloud of blood, it's as if human beings are so significant that the identity of Allah is somehow reliant upon the existence of human beings. La hawla wa la illa billah. That's not the case. Actually, Allah is saying, read in the name of your master who created. Stop. Oh, yeah, by the way, yeah, human beings, he also created you, yeah. He created human beings from a cloud of blood. It's almost like that, to make you humble, to make you at your position. Remember, we said iqara indicates the position and superiority of Allah, right? And khalaq al-insana mi alaq is to put you down. So this is a double way humiliating process. Allah uh, glorified himself and humbled human beings. And this is the attitude we should develop before we move on to any other ayah of the Quran. Allah is developing this attitude first. He said he created human beings from a clot of blood, a coagulation of blood. You know, that's it. Alaq, actually, it's very interesting. Uh, from a biological point of view, nowadays, in modern biology, in English, they call the beginning of indep independent human life uh, zygote, correct? We have a biochemistry major here. Zygote or zygote? zygote yeah. That's the name when, when, a, when a sperm cell and uh, egg cell combines and a new form, uh, a new life forms and starts, that's kind of uh, the beginning stage is called a zygote. Look at this. The word zygote is from Greek, zygun, which means to join. So the word alaqa, uh, in, uh, from the root aliqa, ya'laqu, which means to join, to stick to, to connect. So basically Allah said, I created human beings from zygote. <laughs> About 12 centuries before modern biology named it this way, uh, used this word. So Allah is actually describing uh, the, 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 the human uh, production, reproduction system in a very accurate and concise manner. But if, even if we don't dig that, uh, dig, uh, dig that deep into the uh, scientific uh, realm, still, uh, Allah means a cloud of blood, and that's what we are made of. This is further to, to, uh, to humble us, to let us remember our origin what we were before we were born into this world. Because it's very easy for human beings to forget their past. They are very easily uh, you know, uh, involved in their present. Now we, we are grown up now, we have finished our degree, we're working, we make some money, we buy nice clothes, our language is improving, we can speak you know, better and better, we have more and more friends, we have more and more social network, and we think we're something. But Allah is saying, no, 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 all of you, you are from a cloud of blood. That's what you are. A sperm cell and an egg cell combined. That's what we were. That's our beginning. And we should always remember our beginning, how weak it was, how, how you know, uh, vulnerable it was, how easily it can be destroyed, how easily we could, we could you know, not have been coming to this, uh, this world if anything happened during our mother's pregnancy. We were so weak and so vulnerable, we couldn't protect ourselves. So Allah is reminding human beings that's what we were. During this very short period of quwa, Allah says, I created you from weakness and then I give you a little bit of quwa for just a period of time. And don't forget you're going to go to Allah again, to go to weakness again. So fundamentally we are weak and we have to remind ourselves of that. To feel weak is actually one of the essential elements of, of ibadah, of worship. You, you have to feel weak before you can acknowledge the strength and power of Allah, before you can truly uh, you know, fall down in front of Allah. And to, to declare your weakness is a, is a form of ibadah. In Arabic language, they call it adhullu wal iftiqaru ilallah, to feel weak and humbled and to declare your bankruptcy to Allah. That is uh, one of the best form of uh, action of the hearts. Uh, I forgot to mention that by starting the revelation with iqara, it's a command, right? There are many spiritual schools, many philosophies, many ideologies, many religions that start with a, with a very sophisticated and complicated and complex uh, introduction of information. Uh, for example, when you read some philosophy books, you see things like, I'm just giving an example, you see sentences like, the, the reality of existence is, uh, is a fluid and dynamic flow of consciousness. And then you're like, wow, that's deep. But deep down you're saying, what? What does that even mean? What's that, what's that supposed to mean? But the command and the word of Allah is very concrete and very practical. You immediately know what to do. Iqara, you know what to do. Go and read. So our religion is one that's based on, based on action. It's not something, a very you know, sophisticated system of things, information that you just know about and you have nothing to do about it. No, everything about Islam, you can do something about it. Even Iman, even belief itself is an action. You know, before this surah, in surah 10, 
إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات فيوفيهم أجورهم. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, you know. Yeah. Basically, Allah is saying that those are the two conditions for someone to be successful. Amanu wa amilu salihat. But even to believe, amanu is a fa'il, is a verb. It's something you do. To believe is it's an action of the heart. To believe in Arabic language, amana has the same root as the word amana, which is trust. Right? To put your trust in something, that is an active action you do. Also, it has the same root uh, with amin or, am, uh, or aman, which means security, safety. To feel secure and to, to entrust your security to somebody, that's, that's something you do. That is an active action. So, our religion, starting with iqara, that uh, strengthens the importance of action, of doing things. When you learn something, you know, even Mas'ud, he said, we used to learn the Qur'an 10 ayat at a time. We just learn 10 ayat, we understand it, and then we try to implement it. Before that, we will not move on to the next ten ayat. They will do something about every ten ayat. Subhanallah. So, um, continue with خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقَ That humbled us and uh, that made us know what we are made uh, of and that also showed how Allah is uh, knowing of the most subtle things because a zaygut, uh, a alaq is inside the womb of the mother. That is the most hidden thing. No human being at that time could ever see what it's like, right? They didn't have telescope, uh, sorry, not telescope, microscope. And now we have all the equipment and facilities to know. At that time, they didn't know, but Allah is talking about this subtle, delicate existence, which means Allah knows the very uh, secret and very tiny things. And then Allah continues by saying, Iqara wa rabbuka al-akram. Again, read. Almost as if, you can think about the scenario. The Prophet ﷺ was still very nervous, he was still very scared. اِقْرَأْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقْ خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانِ مِنْ عَلَقْ This is a complete sentence. And then the Prophet ﷺ perhaps wanted to say, wait, 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 wait. He said, no, اِقْرَأْ No, read, continue. You cannot stop, you cannot pause. اِقْرَأْ وَرَبُّكَ الْأَكْرَمْ Read. And your master, your Rabb, is the most uh, honorable and mo most noble and most generous. So, uh, Karim, Karama, this word in Arabic language has two connotations. One is nobility. Oh, yeah, sorry. One is nobility, someone is noble, someone is honorable, being respected by people, so that is a kareem. But also it means generous, generosity, someone who is generous. And those two things in an Arab culture go hand in hand. If you want to attain nobility, if you want to be noble, you need to be generous. And if you are generous, you will attain nobility. Those two things are hand, uh, hand in hand. So Allah is saying, He is Al-Akram, the most noble and the most generous. How does that relate to the previous uh, ayat? First of all, if he's the most generous, that means he gives the, the most heavy or the most tremendous blessing or favor. What did he give? That is embedded in Iqara. He has given you the thing to read, which is the Qur'an. He says in Surah, uh, I think it's Surah Yunus, he says, uh, Ya ayyuhal nas qad ja'atkum maw'idhatum min rabbikum wa shifa'un lima fi suduri wa hudan wa rahmatan lil mu'mineen. Oh, human beings, indeed there has come to you the teaching from your master and uh, a cure for whatever is in the chest and guidance and mercy for the believers. And then by conclusion, قُلْ بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَبِرَحْمَتِهِ فَبِذَلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُونَ هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ Say, that is from the blessing and favor of your master. And because of that, let them be happy. Rejoice, be happy. Because of that, that is better than whatever they accumulate. That is better than whatever they gather. Anything you can gather is not better than the Qur'an. And Allah has given us the Qur'an and has enabled us and taught us the Qur'an. Not only given us the Qur'an, Allah al Qur'an. He taught him the Qur'an. Taught us the understanding of the Qur'an and given us a, a, a Prophet وسلم, who is the most righteous of human beings to to implement the Qur'an so that we can follow, that is the greatest of blessing. And because of that, he is Al-Akram, the most generous, the most noble. But here, you see, there's a wa in between, right? They call it Haraf Watf, uh, the, the connecting word. So, Iqara is Amr, is a command, read. The second part, wa, and after that, Rabbuk Al-Akram, your Lord is the most generous, which is a Jumla Ismiya, is a, is a, a nominal sentence, it's a description of Allah. How does those two things relate to each other? You wouldn't say uh, and between two things if they're not related. It doesn't make sense in language. You wouldn't say, I love butter chicken and Donald Trump is so messed up. It doesn't make sense at all. If you say and between two things, these two things have to be con connected in logic or in something else. So what is the relationship between iqara, read, 
and Rabbukal Akram, and your Lord is the most uh, honorable and generous. So, uh, one of the f uh, first connection is that through reading the Quran, you will attain true uh, nobility. Other things will not give you true long-lasting nobility. Money will give you temporary nobility. Ask those who got uh, bankrupt overnight. One day, everybody respects them. Everybody, everybody speaks to them nicely. And then they went rent a bankrupt. They had no money in their bank account. And their, their, their families leave them. Their friends leave them. And they, uh, all of a sudden, nobody respects them anymore. Nobody respects the, uh, nobody gave them nobility anymore because the, uh, the nobility attached to worldly things are temporary and are very unstable. But the nobility uh, attained through reciting the Quran, through, it's called Quran al Karim. It's, it is noble itself. The Quran is noble itself because it is from Al Akram, from the most noble. It is the speech of the most noble. So, of course, when you recite and when you repeat the word of the most noble, you also attain nobility through it. So reciting the Qur'an is one of the most effective way of attaining nobility. And you would find we have some people in our community which have that kind of demeanor that when people approach them, they immediately love them despite their financial circumstances, despite their social cir circumstances. There are many uncles who just come to the masjid and pray every day. They never give lectures. They, they never share anything of, uh, for, uh, of knowledge. They never talk to people. But when you see them, you just feel this is a very noble person. A lot of times that nobility comes from their recitation of the Qur'an. They recite a lot of the Qur'an. So, uh, what we also find uh, very beautiful is that, think about it, uh, Jibreel alayhi salam is the angel that, uh, that delivered the Qur'an. Of course, he's the noblest angel among all the angels. That, and that is the case. Ramadan is the month in which the Qur'an is reviewed, then naturally Ramadan becomes the most noble month of the year, and that is the case. Laylatul Qadr is the night in which the Qur'an is reviewed, and of course that becomes the most uh, noble night of all the nights in a year, and that is the case. And Muhammad وسلم, is the one who conveyed the Qur'an to human beings, and of course he become Ashraf al wal Mursaleen, the most honor, uh, honored among all the messengers and prophets, and that is the case. So we see a pattern here. Whoever has a relationship with the Qur'an is being honored by it, through it, is being elevated through it. So if you want to be special in the sight of Allah, if you truly want to be honored, if you truly want to have nobility, have a relationship with the Qur'an. Become a sahib al-Qur'an, become a friend of the Qur'an by reciting it, by learning it, by understanding it, implementing it, teaching it, conveying it, and calling people towards it, inshallah. So, uh, <clears throat> there's a... Uh, narration in Sahih, uh, Sahih Muslim on the authority of Abu Umama, he said that the, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, اِقْرَأُوا الْقُرْآنِ فَإِنَّهُ يَأْتِي يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ شَفِيعًا لِأَصْحَابِ He said, recite the Qur'an, because indeed it will come on the Day of Judgment as a Shafi'ah, as an intercessor, your lawyer on the Day of Judgment. Uh, usually, in court cases, the, the status of your lawyer represents the nobility or the status of that person. Poor people have, you know, relatively uh, worse lawyers, and rich people have very good lawyers. Think about it. On the day of judgment, you have the Quran as your lawyer. The speech of Allah will speak to Allah and say, "He's, you know." And uh, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu called them Ashab al Quran, the, the companions of the Quran. And think about it. Imagine the Quran will say, "This is my friend, Ya Allah. Go easy on him. This is my friend." So, what kind of nobility can can top that? What kind of nobility can be better than the Quran talking on your behalf? So that also shows uh, the importance of the Qur'an. <coughs> okay, so, so far we've, uh, we've covered Iqra' Bismi Rabbika Ladi Khalaq Khalaq al-Insana Mi Alaq Iqra' Wa Rabbuka Al-Akram Read and your Lord, uh, your Master is the most honorable. Um, we move on to Alladhi Allama Bil Qalam He's the one who taught by the pen. Actually, this is the same sentence uh, the most honorable, the one who taught by the pen. So, is attached to Al Akram, is a description of Al Akram, the most generous and the most noble. So, he's the one who taught by the pen. And there are two understandings of it. One is the two, uh, the, the pen is how Allah taught, it's the tool that he used to teach. And this makes sense when we refer to a narration by Ubadah ibn Samit. Uh, he was actually giving, suggest he, he was giving counsel to his son. He said, uh, uh, the companion, he said to his son, 
يا بني إنك لن تجد طعم حقيقة الإيمان حتى تعلم أن ما أصابك لم يكن ليخطئك وما أخطأك لم يكن ليصيب ليصيبك. إذا my son, you will never truly taste the reality of faith or the fruit of iman until you know, until you, uh, until you know that what uh, has come to you could never have missed you, and what has missed you could never come to you. This is basically the Qadr of Allah. He's teaching his son the Qadr of Allah. And he supported this by a hadith. SubhanAllah, you see how the companions educate their children. They tell them something about Islam and then they quote a hadith. It's a very, teach, a very uh, beneficial way of teaching them Islam. So he said, uh, after giving this suggestion, he said, سَمِعَتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ يَقُولُ إِنَّ أَوَّلَ مَا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ الْقَلَمْ فَقَالَ لَهُ أُكْتُبْ قَالَ رَبِّ وَمَاذَا أُكْتُبْ قال أكتب ما مقادير كل شيء حتى حتى تقوم الساعة. He said that I heard the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم say the first thing that was created by Allah is an قلم the pen. And he said to the pen write command أكتب. And the pen said وماذا أكتب what should I write my lord what should I write Allah said write everything that is destined everything that has already been decided until the day of judgment. So everything that will happen from the beginning of creation, that pen, to the day of judgment has already been written. The pen is lifted, the ink is dry. And this is uh, uh, recorded in Abi Dawood and uh, At-Tirmidhi as well in a slightly different wording. And it's uh, regarded as Sahih by Shaykh al-Bani. So relating to this hadith, we understand that Allah says he's the one who taught by the pen. Yani if everything that happened, including everything that uh, is holding, holding the universe together, all the natural laws and... and uh, rules, all the, the law of uh, conservation of energy, the law of conservation of math, all of these laws were also written by Allah because you see kataba yaktubu means to write but it also has the meaning of prescribe, right? Kutiba alaykum musiyam is prescribed upon you to fast, it's not written for you. Prescribed yani decided, Allah has disdained it to be this way. So all the natural laws in the universe, they are also, you know, kutiba, kutiba Allah, they are also written by Allah. So Allah is taught by the pen, yani he decided all the things so that you can learn from what he wrote, from what he decided, and what he has, uh, what he has commanded. For example, uh, again, for those of you who study science, we know that the speed of, speed of light is uh, 30,000 kilometers per second. Why is it not a bit more? Why is it not a bit less? Why is, it, why is that the number? Why not five? Why not seven? Why not nine? Why three? No scientist decided it. It's not a scientist who said, okay, let's decide uh, speed of light to be this number. Does everybody agree? It, that didn't happen. They just discovered it to be so. The gravitational acceleration, 3.8 meter uh, per square second on the accurate world, and then it slightly changes towards the two poles. Nobody decided that. We just discovered. The chemical reactions, which, uh, which atoms can react with each other, nobody decided. We just discovered. All of those are kitab Allah, not the book of Allah, the, the prescription of Allah. Allah has described it this way. So that's how we learn uh, from Allah has taught by the pen. Another interpretation, another way of understanding Allah bil qalam is actually He's the one who taught people how to use the pen. He taught people how to write. That is also a very powerful interpretation because the, the ability to write and to record is a cornerstone of, of human civilization, if you think about it. The reason we can build upon previous nations and previous generations, the reason we can uh, develop uh, based on for, uh, previous discoveries and, uh, and uh, uh, scientific achievements is that we can read even until now as developed as the internet as developed as the information technology when we write academic papers university students are real aware of this when we write academic papers you still have to have a long list of reference indicating the things that people wrote before and the things that you read isn't that the case yeah to avoid plagiarism as well. But you are basically saying, oh my supervisor, these are the things that people have written before and have read them. That's what you are saying by reference. So the ability to write and record is the cornerstone of civilization. If we couldn't record everything that happened before, the human civilization will always maintain the same level. Or maybe it can develop, but very slowly, right? It is by writing. And, uh, you know, in archaeology, a lot of times when they discover a new piece of literature, when they uh, dig out a, just a piece of paper, that piece of paper can change our understanding of a historic period entirely. Just that one piece of paper, because what is written can, you know, uh, uh, justify another opinion or challenge an uh, existing opinion. So writing is such a uh, 
tremendous blessing from Allah and such a very important uh, important uh, instrument that human beings uh, used to, to have this civilization. We learn human history primar primarily by analyzing texts and literature. We read books before. And therefore, by Allah saying, Allah is the one who taught human beings how to write, how to record, right? How to scribe, how to archive things. This is also indicating that this, this, is some, this is also a form of learning Allah is expecting of you. So some people have the conception that we should only learn the Quran. That's the sole source of knowledge. We cannot read any of the Kafir books. That's misguidance. That will misguide us. And then they send their children to, <laughs> to primary school, secondary school, which read textbook written by Jack and John and jo Johnson. And, and then they scold at them, how come your score is so slow? But Baba, you said it's a Kafir book. I don't want to score high on a Kafir book. No, see, the, the point is, knowledge, all, all of knowledge is from Allah, uh, uh, ultimately. And that's an uh, understanding of... Uh, the angels, they said, Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma alamtana. We glorify you. We have no knowledge whatsoever except what you have taught us. Anything that you know is uh, primarily and, uh, and ultimately from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As I mentioned, all the rules and laws in the universe, they are also written and prescribed by Allah. And another thing is, I forgot to mention, right after creation, Allah the khalaq, right? Khalaq al insana mi alaq. And then he moved on to mention Allah the alam, he's the one who taught. So two attributes of Allah mentioned in this, uh, uh, two actions, two deeds of Allah mentioned in the surah. One is he, uh, he creates, and the other is he teaches. And these two are closely related to each other. And we can see these patterns throughout the Quran. Think about the story of Adam alayhi salam. We almost knew nothing about Adam alayhi salam after his creation except وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا And Allah taught him the names of all things. And we, uh, in Surah Al-Rahman, Al-Rahman, Again, to teach and to create are closely related to each other. It's almost as if Allah is saying, if you don't seek knowledge actively, if you don't learn, if you don't develop knowledge, what's the purpose of your creation? Why did I even create you? And in Surah Al-Rahman, Allah Al-Quran comes before Khalaq Al-Insan. Some scholars will even say, if you don't make an effort to learn the Quran, you are wasting your creation. You are a wasted creation. Because creation comes even after knowledge. So that is something, this is also something special about our religion. One thing is that it starts with action. Do something about it. Our religion is practic uh, practicable and practical. And the second thing is seek knowledge actively. And, uh, you know, a, a, a very good example is how we can learn not only from revelation. Revelation is, of course, the, the, the fundamental, uh, the foundation of knowledge. It's the core reference when we learn other knowledge. But we should also seek knowledge from other sources, and those eventually also go to Allah. And uh, we have the case of the Prophet وسلم, studying a, a battle technology, a battle technique from uh, uh, Salman, uh, sorry, uh, Salman, uh, wait, Salman al Farsi, yeah, the, the companion from Persia, who knows a technique of digging the trench. And the Prophet وسلم, said, That's a good idea, let's do it. He learned it from a, a, a foreigner, and he utilized it to serve the deen, actually, to, to contribute to the religion. So we shouldn't say that uh, we shouldn't read other books, we shouldn't read literature, we shouldn't read novels. I was reading a science fiction recently. We will never invite Brother Isa again after this. <laughs> Brother Ali Isa will never invite you again, bro. Um, but uh, I was reading a science fiction and it will actually give me many new understandings of the Quran. Not, not trying to justify it for myself. <laughs> I, I literally, I re really uh, had a lot of understanding of the Quran. For example, which actually relates to this uh, next ayah. I will mention it. The next ayah says, Allah al insana ma lam ya'lam. Allah ta he taught human beings what they did not know, right? So, uh, the, the, the science fiction described basically uh, the end of the world when human beings are in touch with alien life forms. And then the author said something that is quite interesting. He said, eventually what limits human beings is not technology. It's not science that limits us, it's morals, it's ethics. It's actually how we understand our existence. What does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to be, to be, to be living? Those very philosophical and ethical questions, that's the things that are limiting us. That's the things that are challenging us. And that's why Allah doesn't have to talk about you know, renewable energy in the Quran. He doesn't have to talk about the orbits of the moon in the Quran. He doesn't have to talk about rocket science in the Quran. Those things are readily available in the universe. You can learn it by yourself. And that's from the Kitab of Allah, the pres prescription of Allah. You can learn it by yourself. What Allah has to tell you is that you can never know by yourself. For example, Jannah and Jahannam, you can never know through scientific research. You will never know. What's going to happen after death, you will never know. 
there are certain things that Allah has kept secret in the unseen uh, so that He will test which people have a higher level of spirituality so that they can believe without seeing. If you only believe when you see, that's what animals can do. Human beings can believe without seeing and that makes us higher in our, in our uh, ability of abstraction. The reason Allah taught Adam the names of all things, what does that mean? Some scholars say the names of all things means language. You can now call things according to Fiqh Dinandi Sosyu, the, the linguist, the signifier and the signified, the name of a thing and the thing has no relationship whatsoever. Why do I call this water? Nobody knows. Water is water. The, the thing, this, this substance has nothing to do with the sound, water. It's nothing to do with it. So language is random, basically. And that's what Allah taught us. Nobody, nobody decided, there's no scientific explanation of why water means water, why dog means dog. Right? There's no, there's no, it's totally random. So that's why interpretation, Allah taught human beings language, which is Allah uh, bayan it stays. But then Allah also taught uh, human beings the ability of abstraction. The names of all things, meaning when I say, for example, uh, Barack Obama, and you have that mental image, he's not here, but you can think about that person in your mind already. The ability to abstract from uh, language, from words, and that is the ability from Allah to us as well. Um, and that is what we need to have Iman, actually, to have faith. Okay, I will try to finish as soon as possible. Uh, people are leaving already, probably because of the science fiction. Yeah. <laughs> people are leaving already, and because of the science fiction. But uh, anyway, right. <clears throat> so, um, the, the final ayah, alhamdulillah. A short summary. اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق. Let's try to let's try to link all the pearls now. اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق. Read, recite, and اقرأ actually also uh, means read after me. Sometimes the uh, teachers they will say that, especially for somebody who cannot read from a piece of paper. That that's almost its only meaning. When you see to a person who cannot read from a piece of paper, read. That means read after me. Repeat after me. And this is uh, basically the assignment of uh, prophethood to the Prophet ﷺ. His entire mission can be summarized by اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق That's his mission, to read in the name of Allah Repeat what he says, that's his mission And uh, so uh, read in the name of your master who created uh, He created human beings from a cloud of blood and These two verses is to glorify Allah and to humble us To, have, to make us have this attitude of who, whose speech this is This is the speech who, uh, of the one who created us and took care of uh, us And nurtured us and nourished us and brought us up خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم recite read and your master is the most generous because he give you the Quran to read and he is the most noble because he has no imperfection whatsoever and الله يعلم بالقلم one of the most uh, uh, amazing manifestations of his karama of his uh, nobility and his generosity is that he taught you uh, through his pen or uh, he taught you how to write as well. And then eventually, he taught human beings what they could not have known. Uh, this is very important because, uh, as I said, first of all, there are things that we can never know through uh, our own understanding. Human logic is limited. And right now, actually, after quantum physics, you would say after the 20th century, we have a very different uh, attitude towards the universe now, especially those of high knowledge. Before the 20th century, human beings are generally very passionate and very ambitious. They can see we can conquer the universe. Human beings can do whatever they want. And after quantum physics, the, the, uh, the uh, phys physicists, they become like, um, this is a bit complicated. Because they find certain phenomena in, 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 in uh, the universe that is not uh, consistent. Yani every time it happens, it's different. Every time it happens, it cannot be summarized by a theory or by equation. Uh, so the scientists are like, okay, there is a, another force that we, ha we have no ability to control. There is another uh, influencing factor that we have no ability to, to uh, use a mathematical uh, way to, 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 to describe. So they actually became more humble. Uh, many scientists actually have become more inclined towards uh, a theist, uh, a creation viewpoint of the universe. Right, I forgot to play for you a video actually. When I, when I, uh, yeah, I'll play this video and then it's done. So, Alam al Insana Malam Yalam is done, very short. It's not science fiction. This is science, pure science. <laughs> it's uh, everything is Islamic. Science is Islamic. So the the purpose of this video, let me introduce to you, is actually about al 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 Remember, I told you Allah said, 
read in the name of your master who created. Finish sentence. Oh yeah, by the way, human beings, yeah, he also created you. This doesn't mean that Allah doesn't care about human beings. He actually said in the previous surah, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ I have created human beings in the best form. He also said, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ Indeed, we have honored and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, beautified and dignified the, the children of Adam. He loves human beings. Human beings is one of his best creation. But that doesn't mean uh, we have certain, you know, uh, we are, like Allah is limited by our existence. No, that's not the case. Allah actually says in the Quran, if you rebel, if all of you rebel and, you know, uh, disbelief. Allah can change, can uh, destroy you and replace you with with another creation. وَذَلِكَ يَصِيرُ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَصِيرُ That is easy on him to to in, uh, eradicate this species and to replace you with another creation. That's easy. There was a time when dinosaurs were the masters of this earth. They were destroyed, totally gone. You cannot even find wine nowadays, right? So to to replace the creation is easy to Allah. And then uh, this is to humble us and to let us realize that human beings as a creation. We are not everything. There are so many other creations of Allah that we should also respect and we should also take into consideration when we think about our existence. Uh, from a time perspective and from a, uh, from a size perspective, uh, we are all very insignificant. So I will play you a video of um, American Museum of Natural History. It's a kafir video, but... <laughs> But uh, let's learn something from it, inshallah. Let's make it Islam. So basically, it talks about the the size of the Earth compared to the size of the universe. It zooms out. Yeah, but this one is, uh, has those green lines are satellite uh, orbits. <laughs> no, this is uh, the, the electric effect, it's not musical instrument. Let me see, it's, it's about uh, four minutes, is that okay? And then it starts going back again, but uh, due to the limitation of time, I think I'll just stop here. And I just want you to <coughs> think about how the creator of all of this, the one who created all of this, decided on a particular, particular night about 1400 years ago to convey his own word to a human being. The one who created all of this. The earth almost doesn't exist when we are at this skew. What about a single human being? What about human beings? And subhanAllah, then should we not be thankful to Allah for His having honored us and having dignified us through His revelation all the way from there to, to our existence. And then, so this is a, 
uh, size perspective. I also have a picture from a time perspective. Uh, not this one, sorry. <laughs> this one, yeah. Okay, so if we think about the history of the Earth as 24 hours, okay, say the Earth has existed for 24 hours, and, uh, wait, what is going on here? But anyway, you can see. Human beings came into existence at 11.58.43. Uh, so the last hour, uh, 11, sorry, uh, the 11th, wait, what is it? Yeah, you think about uh, uh, 12 hours, actually. Yeah, Think of the history of uh, the Earth as 12 hours. Human beings came into existence as hour 11, minute 58, second 43. We've only been here for a little bit more than one minute in 12 hours of Earth history. So that's why when Allah says, Antum ashabdu khalqan amis sama, are you more severe in terms of creation than the sky? The sky actually came even before the Earth. It has, it has a, a longer history than the Earth. So we, all, we have only been here on this Earth a very short of time. We just came in. We just came here. Uh, so we shouldn't be arrogant towards, the, uh, towards other creations. Uh, and we should really feel the, the significance of Allah and His tremendousness through this uh, understanding. So with that, uh, I finished today's sharing. Uh, hopefully, what I have shared today will have given you a better understanding of the ayat of Surah Al-Alaq. And next time you recite Surah Al-Alaq in your prayer, you can feel even smaller, and you can feel how Allah is so tremendous. and how. But still, He said, Rabbuk, your individual master very personal and individual relationship so that should increase our love for Allah and our desire to worship him inshallah so uh jazakumullah khairan for coming subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashhadu wa la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh does anybody have any questions yes so on this topic uh, see it says that uh, all the things that happen within the yeah, think of it at 12 hours. Yeah. 12 hours, 24 hours. So it's, so the, all the existence, even a human, everybody started within the 12 hours. Yeah. Uh, well, according to the BBC's uh, story of uh, that, something like that, it talks about, uh, you know, the, the creation started and then they picked about so many changes, you know, yeah. many destroying, you know, yeah. and, it's 4.6 billion years, I think, the, the age of the Earth, if I'm correct. 4.6 billion years. But this is a... Uh, they they try to scale it in 12 hours. So basically, you, you put 4.6 billion years into a 12-hour uh, clock, and you indicate, for example, half, six hour will be 2.3 billion years. You see? Yeah, just an illustration of it. So in that scale, human beings came into existence only about a minute, or more than a minute ago, which is about uh, 100 million years. In the real, in the real scale. Uh, this is actually in line with the uh, with the Quranic uh, uh, narrative of creation, because Allah said He created because Adam went to the earth from the sky, which means everything on the earth was already there when He went there. So Allah created the earth, the vegetables, the the, the vegetations, animals, rivers, mountains, everything first, and then He said, "I will put on the earth a Khalifa." So. Right. He was created in the heavens. Yeah. We, we can say he came to the earth a hundred million years ago. Yeah. Yeah. But the, so according to the science, they talk about different types of humans. Right. Exodus and yeah. 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 But actually, even uh, when people who, uh, when they talk about evolution, still there is a very clear cut line between human being and other species. Even the earliest human beings, their form is slightly different from us. And actually, from Islamic uh, Islamic point of view, we do not disagree with the the, uh, the element of evolution that talks about the change of uh, physical uh, how to say physical attributes. Yeah. For example, if you're in Africa long enough, your skin will become darker. We believe, we believe that, actually, and we can observe that. So we don't believe that a species can become human beings. That we don't agree. This species is created by Allah. But we do believe that human beings can change in their physical format slightly uh, due to their ge geological uh, uh, and uh, cli climatic differences. So uh, in that sense, 
even people who believe in evolution, they have a clear cut line for saying this is when human being came into existence. Uh, this is where human being started, the first uh, recognized human being in history. Um, and uh, one of the, and nowadays actually, I, I forgot to mention this, why did Allah uh, put so much effort in talking about the ability to speak and write language basically, in summary language. Allah said language is uh, a great gift from Allah, he taught human beings to speak. Nowadays linguists, they have studied uh, the human mind, the, the psychological point of, uh, psych psychological, uh, uh, how to say, composition of language, they found something called a universal grammar, which is a mental faculty that enables human beings to learn any language on earth as long as you're in that environment. So for example, uh, you can be from South Asia, but if your child is born in Hong Kong, raised in Hong Kong, he can speak Cantonese, no problem. Definitely so. There will be, uh, there will be no problem for him to speak Cantonese. This is called universal grammar. And only human beings have this. Linguists, they've tried to teach the second most intelligent animal on earth, such as dolphins, or, uh, or blue well, or you know, grow less, as they say. They try to teach them languages. They can ma uh, master maximum 100 sign language, 100 signs, maximum, that's it. But we, every day, we can utter more than 10,000 words, and the, the combination has never repeated. Whatever, what I've said today, I've never said them in this particular combination in my entire life. Every day is a novel combination of speech. So the ability to speak, it has actually become a very, very strong evidence to the linguists. Uh, the, the book I read, and I was, this is a Kafir book, <laughs> I was not studying Islamic science, I was studying intro to linguistics in Tufts University in Boston. The book, the author, who is not Muslim, he actually says the, the discovery of the universal grammar negates evolution. Because evolution doesn't explain this. There's no evidence to say that universal grammar e evolved. It has always been there in human species. As a matter of fact, we can actually say that the ability to speak devolved. It has become worse. Shakespeare's English is better than any of our English. And ancient Chinese people, they speak Chinese better than me. Language-wise, language, uh, language uh, wise, we are actually devolving. We're becoming worse. So, yeah, they actually use that as evidence to say language is uh, uh, from God who enabled human beings to speak and to learn language. Uh, but uh, when you're talking about time, this actually doesn't negate the Islamic narrative. So when human beings came to earth, Allah also said that he created human beings after other creation, right? He created the heavens and the earth in six days, right? And seven days. And then eventually, actually the last part of the day, that's human being. So which actually can be, uh, can be illustrated by this as well. You're asking a date? <laughs> I don't know, you can try to add that in and, and put it on in Google so that it will not be a cafe picture anymore. It will be a Muslim picture. <laughs> Allah is the one, the one, the one, the one.